Atomic bombs began with the Nazis. In 1939, Albert Einstein was afraid that Hitler would use the recent discoveries of nuclear fission to make a super weapon. His fellow physicists and emigres from fascism, Leo Szilard and Enrico Fermi, helped him write his famous letter to Franklin Delano Roosevelt. The world's most celebrated scientist warned FDR that it might be possible to set up a nuclear chain reaction in a large mass of uranium by which vast amounts of power would be generated. This new phenomenon, he said, could lead to extremely powerful bombs of a new type. He urged FDR to match what he thought was a German effort, not to actually use the bomb, but to deter Hitler from using it. Einstein later called the letter the greatest mistake of his life. There was no determined German or Japanese program, but by the spring of 1945, the program Roosevelt had started was close to testing the world's first atomic bomb. Nonproliferation began with the scientists. In June 1945, one month before their atomic tests, some of the Manhattan Project scientists formed a committee led by Nobel laureate James Frank. The group included Zillard, and Eugene Rabinowitz, the drafter of the committee's report and six months later, co-founder of the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. The Frank Report warned that the United States could not rely on its nuclear monopoly indefinitely. Presciently, they said that numerical superior arsenals would offer only false security. In words as true today as they were 60 years ago, they wrote, quantitative advantage will not make us safe from sudden attack. Unless America quickly secured an international agreement, there would be a flying start of an armaments race. They had hit upon a core truth. Preventing proliferation requires a political solution. The science of nuclear technology cannot be otherwise contained. Their efforts were picked up soon after the war. The hope of civilization, President Harry S. Truman said in his message to Congress in October 1945, lies in international agreements looking, if possible, to the renunciation of the use and development of the atomic bomb. In November 1945, when the entire global arsenal consisted of two atomic bombs in the United States, Truman joined with the leaders of Britain and Canada to propose to the new United Nations that all atomic weapons be eliminated and that nuclear technology for peaceful purposes be shared under stringent international control. Independent research groups helped develop the proposals. The Carnegie Endowment for International Peace played a leading role, forming a committee on atomic energy in November 1945. After a two-day conference debating proposals, a high-level panel chaired by James T. Shotwell released detailed recommendations for the international control of nuclear materials and bombs. In June 1946, Bernard Baruch presented the complete U.S. plan to the new United Nations. We are here, he said, to make a choice between the quick and the dead. If we fail, then we have damned every man to be the slave of fear. Baruch called for a new international authority that would own and control the dangerous elements of the nuclear fuel cycle, including all uranium mining, processing, and enrichment facilities. Once assured that no other state was able to construct a bomb, the United States would eliminate its weapons. The UN Atomic Energy Commission approved the plan in December 1946, but Cold War tensions killed it within months. Stalin saw the bomb as more than a weapon. It was a symbol of industrial might, scientific accomplishment, and national prestige. Stalin told his scientists, Hiroshima has shaken the world. The balance has been broken. Build the bomb. It will remove the great danger from us. Both nations opted to seek security through atomic arsenals, not atomic treaties. And so the arms race began. In 1948, after the coup in Czechoslovakia and the Berlin crisis, Truman ordered the first major increase in weapons production. By late 1949, the US arsenal had grown to more than 200 weapons. This was the crucial fork, 
the road wrongly taken that effectively institutionalized a policy of nuclear one-upsmanship. When the Soviets tested their first atomic bomb that year, Truman raised the stakes, accelerating a program to build a super or fusion bomb. David Lilienthal wrote in his diary, more and better bombs, where will it lead? We keep saying we have no other course, when what we should be saying is we are not bright enough to see any other course. The Scientific Advisory Board to the President on Atomic Matters strongly opposed the hydrogen bomb, including Robert Eppenheimer, a former leader of the Manhattan Project. They believed it a weapon of genocide. They reported to President Truman that the H-bomb was not militarily useful. Rather, it, quote, carries much further than the atomic bomb itself the policy of exterminating civilian populations, close quote. Even if the Soviets developed the H-bomb, they argued, the United States could deter its use with fission weapons. The scientists' views did not prevail. The United States tested the first H-bomb in November 1952 with a yield of 10.4 megatons, almost 1,000 times more power than the fission bomb that had destroyed Hiroshima. Predictably, the Soviets tested their first fusion device a year later, in August 1953. Albert Einstein wrote, the idea of achieving security through national armaments is, at the present state of military technique, a disastrous illusion. The armament race between the USA and the USSR, originally supposed to be a preventive measure, assumes hysterical character. During the 1950s, the arms race made the United States more vulnerable, not less. America's nu nuclear arsenal mushroomed from 400 weapons in 1950 to 20,000 weapons by 1960, including 10,000 new tactical nuclear weapons for battlefield use. Moscow's arsenal likewise jumped from five warheads in 1950 to 1,600 by 1960. The United States was ahead, but afraid. Every one of my generation remembers the duck and cover drills in school, the tests of air raid sirens and civil defense emergency broadcast systems. The growing fears of the nation were captured in popular books and movies, such as On the Beach, Failsafe, and Dr. Strangelove. A whole new genre of science fiction films were spawned, such as Them, that featured giant mutant ants crawling out of the Nevada nuclear test site an apt metaphor for the proliferation then underway. As the atomic scientists had warned, numerical superiority did not bring security. Tensions were high, and confrontations in Berlin and Cuba in the early 1960s would put the world on edge. Moreover, the threat no longer came from just two states. Britain joined the nuclear club in 1952, France in 1960, and China was not far off. The U.S. intelligence community concluded that as many as 16 states could have nuclear weapons by 1968. U.S. leaders were thus faced with the crucial question of how best to protect the nation, build more weapons or try to climb down. For John F. Kennedy, the answer was clear.